Hey, good morning. Hey, welcome back to Generations Church. Isn't it good to be back? Woo. Man, y'all look good up there. I was telling you yesterday, I, that's where I'd be like the, the back row. That's the exit row. It's got a little more leg room. I'd be up there. That's so cool. So glad you're with us today. Oh, man, it's good to be together. Um, we're so grateful to God for this renovation, for this building. It feels like a brand new building, you know. I'm so grateful to God for you, for your sacrificial giving, your prayers, your work to, to allow us to get to this point. It's pretty amazing because, um, I mean, when can you do something, you know, $2 million and just pay cash for it? So it's pretty amazing. Thank you so much for this, um, your generosity and... Thank God, thank God for uh, his provision for us. Now, um, we wanted, we worked so hard, we wanted it to be like just perfect when you came back and like everything finished, but um, no, it's not. Uh, supply chain issues prevented a lot of that. So you'll see over the next few weeks and months, uh, little improvements along the line in, in the audio and the lighting. I mean, we don't even have the upstairs right now because we have a temporary CO to be in here so we're waiting on electrical components from somewhere in Taiwan or China. I don't know where they are. And when they come in, so, so the breaker panel that powers the upstairs, we're waiting on that whole thing. So when that comes in, hopefully in October, um, we will uh, we'll get our, our permanent CO, which will allow us to use the whole building. But you'll just see a lot of improvements over the next few weeks, and, uh, and it'll be fun. You know, every time you come, something will kind of be different. But we're just so grateful to be in here and to be together. Last week... At Caswell, we started um, a new series looking at three different animals. Um, and maybe you watched it online if you weren't Caswell, but the rhino, the bison, and the lamb. And it's a fun series because we're looking at these animals, and, and each one of them are teaching us a different aspect of faith. And, you know, we, we started talking last week about the rhino, and the rhino doesn't really go backwards, the rhino just goes forward. That's the way he does. He doesn't even see good, but he's like, I weigh 2,200 pounds, and I got a horn in the middle of my head, and I'm coming at you. And, and, and sometimes that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to move forward in faith. And in one of my finer moments as a pastor, um, I tried to illustrate faith, and um, some of you are laughing because you were there. And so if you've ever seen a, a faith fall or like a trust fall, so I got on the front of the stage at Cas. Well, I'm not going to do it now, but I got on the front of the stage and um, I called a couple of guys out of the audience who, really strong guys, but you know maybe not the sharpest knives in the drawer. Um, <laughs> so no, <laughs> I'm just mess. If Chris or Zach are here, I love you guys. You're really smart. It was my fault. It really was. So anyway, called them up, and um, you know they were going to catch me as I fell backwards off the stage. Well, I kind of set it up. I said, "Okay, you ready?" And I and I went. And about halfway down, I'm thinking, eh, they're, they're not ready. <laughs> they are, I feel no pressure against my back. They are not going to catch me. Well, eventually they kind of caught me. We were all in a ball in the middle of the floor. I hit the ground, but I, I didn't get hurt. I think they were hurt more than me because I weighed 230 pounds. I landed on them. So anyway, it was fun. Um, this week, though, we're talking about sheep. So hopefully no, there'll be no, no violence, no one will get hurt, uh, because sheep teach us about a different aspect of faith than the rhino does. The sheep teach us about a dependent type of faith. Matter of fact, just look at this guy. I mean, he is so dependent on just the shepherd. He's got an umbilical cord hanging down. I mean, he's just like just born, <clears throat> a little ewe lamb, so cute. All the women were like, oh, you know. But let, can we just be honest, though? As cute as this guy is, uh, nobody here, especially us men, want to be a little ewe lamb, right? <laughs> we don't want to be a little lamb dependent on somebody. We want to be this guy right here. We want to be a 2,200-pound rhino run 30 miles an hour, horn in the middle of our head. If there's a challenge, I'm coming right at you, right? <clears throat> but let me be honest today. If you want to be this guy, if more important, 
if you want to please the Lord, if you want to go to heaven and have all your sins forgiven, we first have to be this guy. We have to find a dependent faith before we, talk, before we find a, a rhino forward type of faith. Now, let me prove it to you from God's word because God's the one who said that we had to live in dependence upon him. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, these are the words of Jesus. We'll come back to the lamb in a second, but I want to just show you this. This is so important. This is like the gospel right here. Jesus called a little child to him and he put the child among them. So picture in your mind, you know, all the adults around and Jesus has this little child, puts him there in his lap and he says, I'll tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like this little child, like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Um, so, so that's it, that's it. I mean, that's the gospel, right? I mean, if you wanna know, how, how am I forgiven of my sins? How do I go to heaven? Boom, repent of your sins and become like a little child. Become, what's a child do? I mean, what kind of faith does a child have? Dependent faith, right? They are completely dependent upon their parents especially they're really small. They're, they're dependent on their parents for everything. The mom, if a mom puts a meal in front of her little child, the child doesn't go, mommy, is this poisonous? Are you trying to kill me? No, of course not. The little child just trusts their mommy. They trust their daddy because that's what children do. And this is exactly the kind of faith that God wants you and I to have. He wants us to have a dependence upon him Lord, I can't save myself. I'm not some independent person who can work my way into heaven. That is not the way Christianity works. I can't be real religious. I can't come to church a lot. No, here's what, here's what salvation is. Salvation is, Lord, I repent of my sins. I repent of my strength and thinking I can do it my way. In Jesus Christ, I, put my pla I place my faith upon you. I'm all in on you. That's a dependent type of faith. Does that make sense to you? Okay. If that makes sense, then let's, let's go back to the lamb because again, the lamb is such a beautiful illustration of this kind of faith. <clears throat> I'll go to Psalms 23 because this is a great Psalm. It teaches us how the lamb is dependent upon the shepherd for, for everything. And, th and this is written by King David who was a shepherd. But in the Psalm, here's what King David did. He said, he's probably looking out at the pasture before he became a king, he was a shepherd. He's probably looking out at these sheep and he's going, you know, if I was one of these sheep, this is the way my relationship with my father works. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Isn't that a great, I mean, woof, that's it. We could stop right there. When God is our shepherd, there is no need. There is no want. There is no desire. He satisfies everything when he's our shepherd. He quenches the thirst in our soul. He, lets, he uh, lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. The Lord provides the food I need in the pasture. He provides the water I need in the streams. He provides everything. He, he feeds my soul. He feeds my body physically, spiritually, everything. The Lord is my provider. Philip Keller I wrote a great, a great book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalms 23. And in it, he explained some of the characteristics of sheep that will hopefully inspire you to have a dependent type faith on the Lord, but will at the same time depress you because sheep are so pitiful. And, 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 and unfortunately, the Lord compares us to sheep many times. We act like a sheep. And this morning, I wanna show you some of the ways that we um, are, are sort of like sheep. And if you're taking notes, you write these down, hopefully this will be helpful to you. Uh, again, Keller's book, A Shepherd's Look at Psalms 23, some great insight. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna talk to you about the bad news about sheep. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, I, it's such a bad, corny joke, but I couldn't resist it. You know, anytime we talk about sheep, we, I actually have a couple of sheep jokes. Would you, would you like to hear my sheep jokes? Yeah, a few, okay, a few of you are like, oh boy. Okay, what do you say to a sad sheep? Cheer up, cheer up. Wow, that was that bad, huh? Okay, 
Cheer up. Cheer up. Okay. Uh, okay, here's another one. Um, what do you do, what do you get when you cross an angry sheep and a grumpy cow? A bad mood. Okay. I got a little more laughs over there. All right, here we go. The bad news about sheep. Number one, sheep are anxious. They are so anxious and so jumpy, and they should be. They don't have sharp claws, no sharp teeth. They're small, they're slow. I mean, they are a predator's dream. A, a wolf sees a sheep, he's just so happy because they're so defenseless. And because they're defenseless, they're naturally jumpy. Keller said that if a, a rabbit jumps out of a hole, a sheep will freak out. It's a little bunny rabbit. But the rabbit jumps out of the hole and the sheep will just freak out and they'll start running. And then the rest of the sheep will run with him and it's like a sheep stampede and they're all running and they're like, we don't know why we're running. Why are you running? I don't know why I'm running. Because a rabbit jumped out of a hole. Does that remind you of anybody? How about 2020? The entire human race, you know? We all just kind of freaked out. You know, it's like, Okay, COVID, and, and like we didn't know, right? People were dying and we didn't know, but man, we freaked. We all, we like went, to, ran to the grocery store and bought up all the toilet paper <laughs> because apparently COVID causes unending diarrhea. <laughs> we, you know, we just freak out, like herd mentality everywhere we go. And it's not just that. I mean, you look at what we do. I mean, stock market corrections, they have to put in like stop gaps and protections so a stock won't go up or down too much because people can freak out. You know, a hurricane could be, it could be a tropical storm a thousand miles off the coast. And I go to the grocery store and there's no water. I'm like, what happened here? People freak out. You know, traffic jams, all this stuff. A wise sheep will stop and ask, is this a wolf that wants to kill me? Or is this a rabbit that jumped out of a hole? Wise people will do the same thing. So sheep are anxious, but sheep, I hate to say it, but sheep are dumb. Sheep are really dumb. Part of the reason the shepherd is so necessary for the survival of sheep is because the sheep will literally like die. They'll just kill themselves accidentally without the shepherd to pr protect them. So sheep are so dumb, and you're supposed to say, how dumb are they? Okay, I will try it again. All right, sheep are so dumb. They're so dumb that they will eat all the grass in a pasture and then they'll overgraze. They'll eat the grass so there's no root left. Instead of like looking around for another pasture, the sheep will be like, oh, well, all the grass is gone. And they'll just lay down and they will die in the pasture because they don't see any more grass. I mean, how dumb is that? Sheep are so dumb. They're so dumb that they will drink water out of a puddle and then they'll pee in the puddle. I know. And then the sheep will come behind them. They'll drink from that puddle. They'll pee in the puddle. Another sheep will come. Just like, this is why the shepherd has to lead them to clean streams and to good, good places to drink water. I mean, sheep are so bad. Matter of fact, I want to show you how dumb sheep are. You might have seen this YouTube video before. I saw it a few years ago. I'm like, oh, yeah, sheep are dumb. Ch check out the screen. I know, he can't get out of the hole. So he's pulled him out of the hole. Oh, he's safe. But then watch this. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I, my point is proven. They're so dumb. Now, if there's any area, this will depress you, if there's any area where we're most like sheep, it is this area. Not, not because we're dumb by nature. Matter of fact, I would say next to the angels, God created us as the most intelligent creatures in all creation. But there's something that makes us dumb. And you know what it is because you committed it this week. And when you committed it, you were kind of dumb in that moment. And so was I. It's sin that makes us dumb. Sin like takes our eyes off what God has called us to do and what he's called us to be. And I want you to think about this. I'll kind of prove it to you. Think about the very nature of sin in relation to God. Who is God? Well, he's our creator. He's our judge. He's our savior. He's our redeemer. He knows everything about us and everything about everything. 
And so God has told us in his word, he's told us through our life experiences, through the wisdom of our parents, through other people's way he speaks to us, God has told us the path we are to walk. He says, this is the path I have for your life. This will be a blessing to you if you'll walk this path. And like sheep, we go, I don't care. I'm gonna do what I wanna do, right? And, and we hurt ourselves. Watch you look at Jeremiah chapter five, verse 25. Your wickedness has deprived you of these wonderful blessings. That's what our sin does. It deprives us of blessings. Your sin has robbed you of all these good things. God has so many blessings for us, so many wonderful things for us, but we choose to do it our way and we, and we suffer as a result. I love Deuteronomy 10, 12. The, this verse is so powerful. This is one we need to memorize. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? So what's God require of us? What's God's path? He requires only that you fear the Lord. What a blessing to fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. That's Old Testament, New Testament. God wants us to love and serve him. When we love God, it just takes care of a lot of sins. And, here, and listen to this. And you must always obey the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today. Say it with me. For your own good. I mean, God gives us his commands because he loves us because he knows the best way that will be the biggest blessing to us. It's for our own good. But then we, like a sheep, just do our own thing. And, and, and see, we've just been deceived to think that, <clears throat> excuse me, sin is more fun than walking with God. And you know what? Sin, the Bible tells us, sin is fun for a season. It's fun to sit down and eat a dozen donuts in one sitting. It is fun, but then that five minutes of fun leads to like five hours of, oh, I wanna throw up. That's the way sin is. It's fun for a moment, but then all the, the consequences and the regret and the things that come with it make us go, man, if only I would have obeyed the Lord who loves me, who's got this perfect path for my life. I read recently about a guy <clears throat> named Bradford Wetzel a few months ago, he left a bar intoxicated, so drunk, in fact, that he could not find his car. He was looking, he was walking around trying to find his car, couldn't find it. And this is why God tells us it's a sin to be drunk. We shouldn't be drunk, but we should be sober-minded because we do dumb things like a sheep when we're drunk. So anyway, Wetzel couldn't find his car, so he stole a car and started driving around to look for his car. Yeah. So I can't find my car, let me steal a car and drive around. Well, it gets worse. The car that he stole, stalled out on railroad tracks. <clears throat> now, thankfully, he got out of the car when he heard the train whistle coming. But the car stalled on the railroad tracks and the train hits the car. He's not in it, but it hits the car. It catapults the car to a nearby, somebody who lived close to the tracks, catapulted into the side of their house. They were sleeping, but they're awake now because a car hit the side of their house, caused all kinds of damage. Well, Wetzel's not done. He's still looking for his car. So he breaks into a fruit stand nearby. I guess he's hungry. I don't know, two in the morning, he wants some fruit and still couldn't find his car. So then he attempts to steal a forklift because after all, the best way to find your lost car is to drive around a forklift at two in the morning to find your car. Well, he couldn't get the forklift started. So eventually he waved the cops down and <laughs> because he couldn't find his car and he was drunk. When they, of course, they were looking for him. He was arrested and charged with grand theft and criminal mischief. Additional charges are pending. Now, I can't completely blame Brad because sin always makes us look stupid. I'm not sure I've done anything quite as stupid as that, but I've done some dumb things when in sin and so have you. We've told lies, <clears throat> excuse me, and expected a good result, right? We've overindulged in food or alcohol or some vice, and we expected to feel good afterwards. <laughs> How dumb is that? We've, we've done incredibly selfish things toward a spouse or a child, and we expected not to have any consequences in our relationship with that person. It's just crazy, but that's the way sin is. It's irrational, 
It's short-sighted. It promises the good. It promises all the fun, but it doesn't warn us about the consequences of that path. Here's the third thing. Sheep, third bad thing about sheep is they're prone to wonder. And you probably knew this about sheep. If you've read anything in the Bible, you know that one of the things that constantly talks about in the Bible is how sheep like to wonder. Now, sheep are not browsers uh, like deer. They don't, they don't eat the grass and then look up. You know, they're not, they're, they're more like grazers, head down in front of them, eating the grass in front of them, like completely oblivious to the world around them. They will, they will stay grazing so long, eating the grass, whatever's in front of them, they'll wander away from the rest of the, of the flock of, of, of other sheep. They will wander away from their shepherd. They'll, matter of fact, they've been known to eat grass to the edge of a cliff and walk off the cliff. Again, dumb and prone to wander. Um, and so a shepherd has to protect them. A sheep will do this. They'll, they're so you know, focused on the grass, grazing the grass, they'll walk away and they'll be by themselves and they'll look up and they're surrounded by wolves. And they'll be like, whoa, whoa, how did I get here? That's how prone to wonder they are. Jesus told a parable to describe God's love for wandering sheep in Luke 15, because we're like that, right? We like to wander away. Uh, so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? <clears throat> Won't he leave the 99 others? And we're not shepherds. We don't, we don't know that, they would do that. So Jesus tells us this is what they do. They'll leave the 99 others who are you know, safe, they're in the herd, they're in the flock, in the wilderness, and they'll go search for the one that is lost until he finds it. And, and aren't you thankful? Because many of us in here, that's where we were. We, were. we had drifted away, we had wandered away, we were a lost sheep, and God came and found us. Thank God for that. First Peter, <clears throat> well, Peter if there's a guy who understands firsthand what it means to wander away, it would be Peter. On the day of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter denied that he even knew the Lord three different times. I don't even know the man. And he'd followed him around for three years and said, I you know, completely denied him. Well, later in life, after Peter you know, is forgiven, restored, and is a leader in the church, this is what he said. First Peter chapter 2, verse 25, once... You were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to, the, to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. I love that little phrase. Jesus is the guardian of our souls. We wander away from him, but he's guarding us. He's watching over us. He's protecting us. We have a tendency to wander away, but he's guarding our souls. I remember talking to a lady a few years back and she was getting back involved in Generations Church and she said that, you know, several years ago, I moved in with my boyfriend. I knew it was wrong, but we loved each other. And I thought, you know, I could change him and, you know, all that. But she said, I felt guilty for, you know, shacking up with my boyfriend. So I stopped coming to church. I walked away from the Lord. I just, I've been away from the Lord a long time. She said, that was, that was nine years ago. And she said, so I'm here today and I'm making a decision to, to, to get to, to stop drifting away, to stop walking away from the Lord. I'm going to walk with the Lord, with or without him. And eventually it was without him because he wasn't interested in marrying her anyway. He was just interested in playing house. I totally get her experience. It's so easy to drift, to drift from God, to drift from the church, to drift from your spiritual passion with the Lord. And then you wake up one day and you're like all by yourself and you're surrounded by wolves and you're like, how did I get here? It's easy. We just drift away from the Lord. We, we, we take him out of our eyes and out of our lives and we drift away. However, as bad as sheep, some bad characteristics of sheep, there's something else I want you to know. There's something great about sheep and that's that sheep are incredibly valuable. I mean, they're a lot of trouble to care for um, because they're so dependent, but humans have been caring for sheep for thousands of years for, for the simple reason that they are so valuable. Their wool is valuable for clothing, for insulation, furniture, skin care. I mean, wool is used for, has all kinds of uses. They make good lawnmowers. 
you know, you got to move them around or they'll overgraze, but they'll mow a, a field down. Uh, their milk is more nutritious than cow's milk. And of course, who doesn't love lamb chops and mutton? Sorry, I know he's so cute, but man, I love some lamb chops. But honestly, one of the things that make a sheep the, the most valuable, especially in biblical times, was their companionship. Um, in, in biblical days, they, they didn't have dogs. Dogs were unclean to Jews. So they, and cats are still unclean to all of us. But anyway, <laughs> um, so they didn't have dogs and, and cats. They had sheep that were their pets. You might remember the story of King David when he had sinned with Bathsheba, committed adultery and murdered her husband. It was a horrible time. And Nathan the prophet came to David and he told him this story about this guy, this family who had this little lamb and they cared for their lamb as a pet. And this uh, other, and he was kind of a poor guy, but the rich guy had a whole herd of sheep and, and, and the rich guy had a guest come in town. So he took the lamb from this family, he took their family pet, he slaughtered it and fed it to his guests. And David was so mad, you know, he's like, I can't believe he did that. You know, and, and Nathan said, you're the man because he confronted him. He was like, that's what you did. You killed Uriah the Hittite and took his wife and all that. But David was so passionate because like he understood that love for that sheep because he was a shepherd. He understood that was like the family pet. That was, a, they, you know, a great companion. If you saw the movie Babe many years ago, you saw the sheepdog that would, you know, herd the sheep and what made the movie kind of, you know, funny and weird or whatever was this pig named Babe. And Babe was a sheep herder too, but he herded the sheep different. He didn't, you know, snap at their heels. He walked up to him and said, hey, could you please go in the sheep pen? You know, he's like real nice to them. <clears throat> and they did what he said, talking pig and all that. Well, biblical shepherds are a lot more like Babe than they are like sheepdogs. Biblical shepherds, they, they don't drive sheep. They lead sheep. They call sheep by name and the sheep follow them. I'm told that even today in the Middle East, that's the way they don't use sheepdogs. There, there's a shepherd and he calls them by name and he leads them out and they follow him. It's pretty cool, which it really brings a new understanding to Jesus' teaching in John chapter 10. This is an amazing chapter and I don't have time to cover the whole chapter, but it's Jesus teaching about this relationship between sheep and shepherds in his relationship between us and, uh, and him. So John 10, 1, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold or a sheep pen, <clears throat> rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. So biblical days, a sheepfold or a sheep pen would look something like this. It would be a, a stone gate or, or possibly a cave with an opening, but there would be a door, a, a gate. And, and sometimes there would be a literal gate, but sometimes the shepherd would sleep um, there by the gate and the sheep would be inside at night, protecting them from the wolves. And he would be there and he would be their protector. And Jesus is saying, you know, someone who, who comes over the side, they're not looking out for the sheep. It's like somebody, if somebody comes in your window tonight when you're sleeping, they're not looking out for you. They're looking out for themselves. The person who doesn't come in through the gate, they're looking out for themselves. They have ill will in mind. They're trying to steal. They're trying to do whatever. And of course, he's referring to the false teachers of the day, uh, the false messiahs, the Pharisees, the other people, and even in our day, false teachers, people who, who don't have our will. And re ultimately, we know this from like verse 10, which I won't read, he says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Ultimately, it's Satan himself. And then he contrasts that with himself. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. That would be him. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice, and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. That's what the shepherd does. He leads them. He doesn't drive them. He doesn't sneak in. He's not, he doesn't have ill will. And this is an amazing passage. If we had time to read the whole thing, Jesus is making a, a, a really bold claim. He's basically saying, look, I'm the Messiah. I'm the fulfillment of all these prophecies. I am the shepherd of the sheep of Israel and even the Gentiles, <clears throat> you and I. He is our shepherd and he is calling us. He is leading us, wanting to lead us. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them 
and they follow him because they know his voice. That's really important. We'll come back to that in a second. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know a stranger's voice. They only know the shepherd's voice. Do you know why you're in church today or watching online? Do you know why? Very simple. You've heard the shepherd calling you. Now, I'm not saying that you've heard his audible voice. Um, I'm not even saying that you're a child of God, that you're necessarily uh, a sheep of Jesus Christ. That, that comes, like I said earlier, when we repent of our sin and we begin to follow Jesus. If you've done that, then yeah, you are, Jesus is your shepherd. But he, here's what I am saying. I am saying that your whole life, God has been pursuing you. That desire that you had when you drove by Generations Church, uh, I need to go to that church. That voice to read your Bible, to pursue God, to hear a sermon, that drawing to, to have a relationship with God, that is your shepherd who is calling you by name. God's been doing it your whole life. If you look back at your life, you'll see, you'll see conversations, You'll see circumstances of what happened that drew, that drew you to this place where you are today. Your shepherd is calling your name. Now here's the question. Will you respond to his call? Will you respond? Now before you answer that, before you answer it, let me tell you something else about this shepherd. In the history of the world, no shepherd has ever done what this shepherd has done. They didn't have the desire nor the ability to do it. Here's what this shepherd did for you and me. Jesus is the only shepherd who became a lamb. That's what he did. 2,000 years ago in a place called Bethlehem, our savior, our creator, humbled himself and became a lamb. God became a human being to die for human beings. Jesus became the Lamb of God to, to become a sacrifice for the sins of the world. I want to read Isaiah, just a portion of Isaiah 53 to you, because there's no verse that explains what Jesus did better than this verse. I want you to listen to this, and I want you to think about this is what Jesus Christ did for me, because this is, this is for us. This is what Jesus did. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected. <clears throat> Excuse me. A man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Most of our life, that's the way we've lived. I'm gonna do my own thing, Lord. I don't care what you say. We despise the Lord. We rejected his way. <clears throat> Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. It was our sin that was placed upon him. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he never sinned. He was a spotless lamb of God. People around the cross said, he's dying for his own blasphemy. If he's son of God, let God rescue him. They mocked him. And the whole time, he was dying for their sins and for my sins. That's what he did but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've walked away from the Lord. We have left God's path to follow our own because that's what sheep do. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep, I want you to picture this in your brain. As a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He never opened his mouth and he didn't resist because he willingly, of his own volition, laid down his life for you and me. Not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. Listen to me. He doesn't just love you. He actually likes you. 
He, he likes you so much, he wants you to be with him for all of eternity. That's why he laid down his life for you. That's why he became the lamb that was slaughtered in our place because our sin required a sacrifice. And, and God knew that we couldn't make the sacrifice. Our, our blood is tainted. So God sent the perfect sacrifice, his only begotten son. So what's, what's our response to this? How do we respond to what Jesus has done for us? Real simple, follow Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never repented of your sins and said, Jesus, I wanna follow you. That's how you become a Christian. It's not complicated. We make it complicated. Again, it's not religion. It's not you know, me being a good person. It's becoming, like we said at the very beginning, a dependent child and going, Lord, I need you to save me. And you can pray that this morning. In just a few moments, I'm gonna pray. Make that your prayer. Lord, I'm so sorry for my sins. I come in dependence upon you today. If you've never prayed that as a child, as a lamb, dependent upon the shepherd, today you can do that. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And then you walk out of this building and you keep on following him every day. I'm gonna live in dependence upon you. But here's the cool thing. When you pray and you receive Christ as your savior, he gives you his Holy Spirit. He gives you the power to live for him. So eventually we become like a rhino. We have great faith, but it starts with that dependent faith. And here's the second thing, find your flock. Okay, we just do better. We do so much better when we're surrounded by other sheep, not because we're dumb in a group, but because we're smarter in a group. Like we just do better. We get dumb when we get off, we drift away and we get off by ourselves. And we think we you know, have the solution to all the problems and we wake up and we're like surrounded by wolves. So find your flock, find a small group. You have picked a great Sunday to attend Generations Church or to watch Generations Church because this week we kick off our brand new small group semester, our fall semester of sermon-based small groups, September 11th, the week of September 11th through November 6th. Here's the cool thing, it's a semester that means it's short term, it's nine weeks. It's got an on ramp and an off ramp. So if you join a small group and you're like, these are the dumbest sheep I've ever met, <laughs> then, then you can join another small group in January, right? It's easy to get in and off. So I hope though, look, we need each other. Find your flock, find some people you can do life with and grow with and, and they can pray for you and you can pray for them because that's what it's all about. I can't wait, I'm starting my small group this week and we have all kinds of small groups, men's groups, women's groups, couples groups, Oak Island, Southport, St. James, all these places. So, uh, and we're starting six brand new small groups this semester, already got like over 50. So you'll find one, I promise, that'll fit you in your lifestyle and your schedule. We also have Financial Peace University that starts this week. If you've been arguing with your spouse about money, I'm telling you, I don't have argue, I don't have fights with my wife, uh, money fights. We used to before financial peace, but it changed my life. That class starts this week. It will change your life. It will give you a plan for money. It will really, really help you. Again, it's short term as well, but you'll love it. Dave Ramsey is the video teacher of it, and it'll be a great resource to you. And how do you do that? How do you take your next step? Really easy, 94,000. You text that number and you text the word GC Connect. If you have a prayer request, GC Prayer. But if you wanna get in a small group, sermon-based group, financial peace, starting points kicking off next week, we'll talk more about that next week, this is how you do it. It's how you take your next step and find your flock here. Stop sitting on the sidelines, stop drifting away. It's time to jump in and find your flock. Would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads together and pray. Father, I thank you that oh, you're so good to us, Lord. Thank you for this feels like a brand new building that we get to be a part of and, and get to grow in as a church. And I pray, Lord, that um, there'd be such an excitement in our community about this. People would drive by and they would be curious. They'd want to stop in. And Lord, as, as they come, Lord, that you just draw their hearts here, draw their hearts to you, open their eyes, Lord. And I pray for my friends who are here today who thought Christianity was about religion who thought it was about us fixing it in our own power and us saving ourselves. And I pray that today the light bulb would come on, Lord. They would realize it's about you being our savior, 
you being our shepherd and ultimately you being the lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world and for our sins. And so Lord, I pray that you give them a dependent faith today in you to call upon your name, to be saved. And I pray, Lord, for every person who's just been thinking about small groups but have never taken the step, I pray, God, that you give them the faith today to take their, their next step and to be a part of this church and to plug in here and for their life to be changed. We ask for that, Father. We pray for that transformation. We pray for that salvation. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you move today in a powerful way. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.